question. Um, imagine a world where uh, cities are um, stimulating uh, spontaneous ecologies through bioreceptive and eco-inclusive uh, design. Imagine um, architecture that is not uh, merely constructed, but is growing and, uh, and maturing. Imagine buildings that are not uh, static and inert, but are dynamic and bioreceptive. Uh, where a world, where, where um, a city where alleys and avenues are hosting uh, vibrant uh, eco ecosystems. Uh, this city is an urban reef, a metropolis for uh, all life, just like a coral reef is to, uh, to marine life. Uh, I will guide you today through uh, Urban Reef's vision uh, and how we use and develop uh, computational design uh, strategies uh, to work towards this vision and how we utilize 3D printing technologies to, uh, to materialize this. Um, and I will show you some of our first projects that we use as a first stepping stone towards this uh, broader vision. Uh, our current uh, um, urban environment we design mostly meet with uh, the human in mind, uh, if not even the car. So it's our human habitat. habitat. And if we apply nature, it's, uh, it's a top-down application where we uh, apply uh, natural elements, but mostly as, uh, as aesthetical ornaments. Uh, but if we are to claim the urban environment as the human habitat, along comes the responsibility um, to maintain and enhance its uh, ecological potential. And even if you don't believe in this responsibility and look at it purely from an anthropocentric perspective, the answer will still be that we should strive for healthy ecosystems in the urban environment, considering the environmental challenges that we currently face in the urban environment. Uh, and I'm talking about the urban heat island effect, about uh, floods, about droughts, uh, the poor air quality in the city. So what is now the main difference between um, this urban environment and uh, natural environments where there are actually healthy ecosystems? Uh, our, our urban environment is mainly um, produced uh, in relation to uh, mass production technologies. So most surfaces are flat and smooth, uh, mostly aiming for ease of maintenance, uh, which results in a very inert and static environment. Uh, and if we look at healthy ecosystems in the natural environment, um, we see a lot of diversity, a diversity in, um, or diversity and complexity in uh, organisms, but also in conditions, in morphologies, etc. And this paves the way for emergent conditions uh, where ecosystems could spontaneously thrive without some intelligent agent uh, deciding top down how things should, uh, should, uh, should grow. Um, so at Urban Reef, we aim to develop design strategies so we can actually design with this kind of complexity and diversity in the urban environment. So we, uh, we design spaces again for emergent conditions and ecosystems could thrive uh, spontaneously. So if you want to design uh, kind of natural conditions in the, in, the, in the urban environment, how would you approach that? Um, at Urban Reef, we are looking at natural conditions through which those actual natural, uh, natural processes, I mean, through which those natural conditions also emerged. Uh, and this, this enables us to work with a certain uh, complexity uh, that is far beyond our own comprehension. So we don't necessarily need to understand the full geometric complexity anymore of our designs, as long as we d understand the, the, the morphogenetic process behind it. Uh, and this also results in the diversity and variety that we, uh, that we want to achieve. Um, so we translate those, uh, those natural processes and we uh, create an interpretation and a virtual simulation of those. Uh, and then eventually we translate those simulations into design tools, which usually consist of a sequence of such uh, uh, processes. Uh, and we also analyze, of course, predecessors who already developed such strategies like uh, Alan Turing or Neri Osman, uh, Michael Hansmeier, uh, Aki Menges, uh, Nervous Systems, to just uh, name a few. Uh, I will guide you now through some of those, um, some of those processes that we use. Uh, the first one is, um, is differential growth. Uh, this is a natural... It's the next... Uh, yeah. This is an emerging uh, morphogenetic process in nature, 
um, due to spatially differential uh, growth rates. And this is actually present in most multicellular uh, organisms. And it's also where uh, complexity in multicellular organisms uh, arises from. Um, and yeah, we analyze those and we kind of simplify and translate those into these specific processes. But in the natural realm, this process, but also the next processes that I will explain, um, they are of course part of a much more complex system that uh, is far beyond our own comprehension. So it's always related to, uh, to genetic factors, to environmental conditions, to, uh, uh, to the availability of resources uh, and many more. Um, but in its most simplified form, uh, this process we c is evidently uh, visible in, for example, uh, certain corals or certain flowers uh, and the growth of um, certain mushrooms. Uh, now we translate those in the, into virtual simulations. Uh, I'll try not to get too technical, but we first define a mesh, which is, a, a, this audience probably knows it, but it, it's a geometry and cut software that is defined by points and how these points are uh, interconnected. And then every one of these points, which we call vertices, uh, we push every one of these vertices from its neighbors, but in spatially differential rates, which results in a process that, uh, with an increasing uh, complexity. Uh, and that results in these kinds of geometries, uh, which are uh, interesting to us because it creates a certain diversity and variety but it also tends to um, increase the amount of surface area per unit of volume, uh, which is interesting if that surface is used, for example, for mosses and uh, algae to grow on, or for water to evaporate. I will come back to that, uh, to that later. A second project that, or process that we are using is called uh, diffusion limited aggregation, um, which is a process that happens in nature where uh, aggregation, so growth, uh, is a result of uh, diffusion. And we see that in, for example, the crystallization of certain minerals, um, in, uh, in electrical discharge patterns, so like lightning, uh, and the formation of, uh, of snowflakes. Now, how this works computationally is that we start with a set of points, which we call the seeds, uh, and then we apply another set of points at a distance from those seeds and uh, apply a Brownian motion, that's a sort of a pseudo-random motion to those points towards those seeds uh, until a certain condition is met in relation to those seeds. Then we apply them to the full set of points and we iterate that process. So there's a new set of random points that move towards the seeds and that results in a process like, uh, like in this visualization. Um, and this enables us to work with these kinds of geometries uh, through which a variety of, uh, of spaces and cavities emerge, which eventually will be potential habitats uh, for organisms. Uh, and a third process, I will only cover three today because it's going to be a long afternoon otherwise. But uh, a third process that I'll talk today about is, uh, is a reaction diffusion. Um, this is a process in nature where uh, two or multiple um, chemicals diffuse, but also react to each other. Um, and we see this in ferrofluids, for example, but also in the formation of patterns on uh, certain corals, on uh, seashells, uh, uh, animal skin, uh, etc. And how this works in, uh, virtually is that we apply these on a mesh, uh, where we link a certain value to every point in the mesh, uh, and then iteratively update this value compared to the values of the neighbors and a certain diffusion rate and a, and a certain uh, reaction rate. And these patterns we use um, to inform the uh, formation of textures on our structures. Uh, and this texture again creates another level of uh, diversity and variety, but on a very specific scale. So the scale of the, of the nozzle size and of the, of the layer width and height. Um, and this creates conditions that are suitable for mosses and for uh, algae to hatch on the structures. Now to materialize these uh, kind of complex uh, geometries, uh, we use uh, 3D printing technologies. Um, I probably don't need to explain you all the benefits of 3D printing, but uh, for us it's, uh, it's mainly because of the relative uh, form freedom uh, and the complexity and diversity that we uh, 
that are necessary from our vision, but also from our concepts and our uh, computational design tools. Um, but it also allows for very quick iterating and um, a lot of adaptability towards different types of apl applications that we are developing. Now, I've explained a bit about how uh, computational design tools are developed and how they are informed by uh, natural processes to accomplish this complexity and diversity. Um, but how these are actually elaborated and, and the, the exact parameters that we are using, um, they are a direct result from, um, from the physical uh, parameters. So, for example, gravity, but also material properties. Uh, the printer properties, so the nozzle width, the layer height, layer, uh, layer width, uh, the bounding volume of the printer, etc. Uh, so in this left image, for example, it's very clear how uh, gravity is informed in the, inside of the design process in the, uh, in the eventual materialization, uh, which is not much unlike gravitoprism in plants, so uh, in certain plants that tend to grow against uh, gravity. And how we define these parameters uh, in the process is kind of sort of an evolutionary process, uh, not a computational evolution, evolutionary, but just a heuristic uh, evolutionary process by uh, a lot of printing, a lot of failing, and then iteratively tweaking the scripts, tweaking the parameters. Uh, so the, the, the scripts and the algorithms are increasingly more informed by uh, eventually all the failures, but in the end also all the successes. Um, and with these strategies, we are mainly focusing on two uh, main projects at the moment. The first one we called The Reef, which uh, deliberately was chosen to, to be a standalone sculpture. So all the extra complex parameters that we will have, for example, if we uh, design facade elements like we just heard from the last speaker, um, we could for a moment just get rid of them and focus purely on the design strategies and production uh, technology. Uh, and these structures, they consist of, uh, of a big variety of differently sized spaces, that, which are all interconnected to each other. And they are also all uh, differently oriented towards the sun, towards the rain, towards the, the wind, etc. Uh, and as a result of that, a big variety of microclimates emerges. Uh, and these microclimates are again potential habitats for wide ranges of organisms without us determining we want this specific organism to live here. We just provide the conditions by, uh, by providing diversity. Um, a second project that we are working on is actually similar in concept. So it's um, a variety of habitats due to uh, geometric complexity, uh, but it's connected to a downspout. So there's an inside and an outside, and we can collect and buffer rainwater. Uh, and passively provided to the outside due to the, the, the material's porosity. Um, and besides only uh, providing habitats, this also creates uh, a hatching surface for mosses and for algae. Um, it also uh, cools down and, uh, and humidifies the direct environment due to evaporation, but also to uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, and with that, so also fighting uh, urban heat island effects. Uh, and it also moisturizes the direct soil in which it's placed. Uh, so not by actively tackling all these specific points, but just by uh, passive emergent conditions. Uh, and those uh, projects, we are using ceramics. So ceramics is for us a very suitable material because it has a certain porosity that we need, a certain capillary um, uh, effect. Uh, also the certain structural capacity that we need. Um, and it's relatively sustainable, so um, it just flows with the river. We are based in Rotterdam, so it just flows with the river and we uh, gain the ceramics. But there's one last part that we want to get rid of, and that's the firing process. So we still need to fire this material at 1100 degrees, um, which is yeah, relatively sustainable if you compare it to most material. But this last threshold we want also to tackle in the future. So besides the application research, we have uh, a material research, which is much more ideological. So we are really working with organic materials uh, and preferably also organic hardening processes. Uh, and we do this usually with external parties with much more material knowledge than we do ourselves. Um, so for example, UNI Earth, um, AMS Institute, uh, 
uh, Lindy Kafsia and others. Uh, so for example, we print with mycelium, with certain bacteria, uh, with dredge from the river, uh, with cow shit uh, and more to eventually, hopefully in the long term, uh, combine the practical research and also the, the material research. Uh, and currently at the moment, uh, what we are doing is we are running pilots to investigate different uh, applications. So the main aim is now to go from these standalone sculptures towards actual applications in the built environment. Uh, so eventually we can have an impact, a measurable impact on biodiversity in the, in the urban environment. Um, so don't hesitate also to, uh, to reach out in the QR code that I will uh, show in a sec. Um, and in these uh, pilots, we, we, we test and validate certain hypotheses, but we also focus on different applications and research their market potential because it's essential for a wider application. And we integrate sensor systems on the one hand to validate those hypotheses, but also to uh, show to potential partners what is actually happening. And eventually also to use that as a parameter besides all the uh, material characteristics and production uh, technology parameters in our design process. So also from an ecological uh, perspective to inc incrementally improve the designs. Uh, and we're working on uh, a scaling methods, so uh, componential design logic. So instead of um, standalone structures, we have a limitless size of components that we can interconnect with each other. So also create bigger habitats and, uh, and a bigger impact. So at Urban Reef, we are utilizing uh, interpretations of natural design processes and um, uh, using those to develop our design uh, methodologies. Uh, eventually to create cities in which, uh, which stimulate uh, spontaneous ecologies through bioreceptive and eco-inclusive design. Thank you. Are there any questions, maybe? Thank you very much, yeah. Max. Here we go. Did you try growing bigger plants than uh, algae uh, on, the, on the surface, or no? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question indeed. So the rain, main reason why we are... Um, well, f first of all, the main concept is to just provide conditions. So in the examples that I showed that are connected to a downspout, um, we didn't do anything. We just put it there and then left it um, so, so stuff emerges. Um, with the aim to really create a healthy ecosystem that is actually a local vernacular system. Um, but the, the ceramic structures, they are mostly suitable for mosses and algae because um, uh, mosses don't have roots. They have rhizoids, which are sort of small claws. Uh, so they can actually hatch on hard surfaces like ceramics or concrete, etc. And if you go to vascular plants, they really need a soil, first of all, for their nutrition. But eventually they are even social beings, so they need connections with other plants. Um, so in that perspective, uh, applying trees and plants on like 80 meter, square, uh, 80 meter high, uh, high rise buildings is also maybe not the most natural way, uh, way to go. Um, yeah, so that's why we are focusing at the moment on, uh, on such uh, organisms. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you very much. At least three people have used Slido to submit their questions okay, yeah. uh, on the app. So I'm just going to pick one of them, and that's from Robert, because he put his name. The others are anonymous. Are your tools available for use commercially? Uh, uh, could you elaborate on it? Are your tools available for use Our commercially? Our tools? Yeah, ah, yeah that, that's a good question. Um, they are in the form of pilots. Okay. So we are, uh, yeah, we are setting up these pilots as a product uh, also to develop from our perspective, but also to develop it in relation to uh, potential partners. Uh, so yes, uh, and please reach out if, you, uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, we are though still in a development phase, so these pilots are used to, uh, to have multiple perspectives and to bring this also to a bigger and higher, uh, yeah, higher quality. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You